It's been over two weeks since I've had the honor of standing in front of the camera for our online content, but I'm happy to be back and have several items to share with you prior to getting to our teaching time and continuing our theme of redemption for this summer. Coming up this week, we have a night of worship and prayer on Wednesday evening, July the 21st from 6.30 to 8 here in our multi-purpose building. This is a time to reset, to be together, to worship, to pray, and simply slow down and fellowship. Last month, we had our first time of prayer and worship on a Wednesday night. It was beautiful. It was powerful. We look forward to you joining us for this time this coming week, Wednesday evening. There is no childcare. There are no other ministries taking place during that time. We wanted you to be able to join us for worship and prayer, 6.30 Wednesday. Also, just around the corner is a four event. Four events are opportunities where we try to impact our local community because God is for us. We want to be for those around us. So on July 27th, 28th, and 29th, we're going to be have big opportunities for you to help us impact 100 local teachers and 250 local students by allowing them to shop for school supplies for the upcoming school year. It seems crazy, but August 7th, a lot of our teachers have to go back to work. So we want to be for our students and teachers. In our lobby today, uh, if you are going to be around, we have a volunteer ready to answer questions and disperse handouts for supplies that we need uh, in your help in purchasing for this event. If you're watching uh, this content online, you can come to the office, you can call us, we can get you a supply list, but we need those supplies turned in by this coming Wednesday on the 21st at the latest, because at that point we need to go out, purchase a few more items to make sure we have enough for everyone. If you want to volunteer, you can do that as well by calling the office or by going to the website, clicking on the Four Teachers Students event page. Again, that's the Four Teachers and Student Volunteer page event sign up. Our desire, again, is to have $100 in supplies for 100 teachers. That's a lot, but they spend thousands, some of them, each year out of their own pocket of their supplies. We also want to supply about $35 of supplies for 250 students from local elementary schools. These are great ways for you to reconnect. If you've just been with us online, you can participate and drop your supplies off. You can join us for the night of prayer and worship, as well as participate in purchasing those local school supplies for teachers and students. Again, we need all the supplies turned in by the middle of this week. So why don't you come to the prayer night and bring your supplies with you? I also want to take a moment and uh, acknowledge that next Sunday from 3 to 5 uh, on the 25th, we will have uh, a time to encourage and to launch our student pastor, Trent Santos. Um, Trent is going to be stepping into a new area of ministry outside of the realm of Rich Fork. And so we want to celebrate that with him, uh, with his wife, Sydney, and with their, their children. So we would love for you, if you want to participate, that is on Sunday, the 25th from 3 to 5 p.m. Now, one more thank you. I want to take a moment and say thank you to Matt Bryant and to Neil Brewer for stepping up for me while I was on our family vacation the past two Sundays. Uh, I've had the opportunity to listen to both of their messages, and I love the direction and the ideas that they both added to our teaching on redemption. So with all that said, let's pray and then let's examine our passage about redemption today. God, we come to you, we thank you for allowing us the privilege to serve our community, to shape our community by sharing the grace of Jesus. May we do that with school supplies and times to pray for our teachers and for our parents and our students as they come to pick up supplies. God, may we celebrate in a time of worship and prayer collectively this coming Wednesday. Uh, but God, for the next few moments, help us to examine the coming of the Redeemer, Jesus, but then let us also evaluate and answer, how are we going to respond? What, what does our response need to be to redemption? So prepare us and open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to what you would have each of us to do to respond to redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. Rich Fork, it's great to be back with you. Uh, my family took a family trip to visit friends and family, but it's always good to be back home. 
I heard you had an incredible two weeks of worship and teaching, so I'm ready to jump back in with you into our stories of redemption. For the past six weeks, just as a reminder, we've been on a journey through the Bible examining the story of redemption that runs throughout all of Scripture. We stated in week one as a definition of redemption, this idea. Redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment. Scripture echoes this reality, this definition, that Jesus Christ, He paid a price for our redemption, from mine, for your redemption. From our death by our sins, He redeemed us by His grace. He was the payment. Our summer scripture out of Ephesians is this, in Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of His grace, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So we began six weeks ago in Genesis with moments of grace and discipline, both of which we find in redemption. Then we went on to explore redemptive moments between God and the children of God, the Israelite people. Still in the Old Testament, we explored rescue through the beautiful love story of Ruth. Matt reminded us in Jonah of redemption, and then Neil explored redemption through the emotional roller coaster of Hosea. I loved one of the statements that Neil made in his message. He said, redemption is the exchange for everything that came as a result of our sin, for everything that came as a result of the payment. The impact of Jesus Christ, His redemption, it provides salvation for all who trust in Him. But redemption also promises abundant life through obedience to the teachings of Jesus. Today, we're going to turn the page. It's a big turn from the Old Testament which I have loved exploring the stories of redemption. Now we're going to turn to the New Testament. But let me set the stage for you in this way. As I shared earlier, I mentioned that our family took a family vacation. And to be quite honest with you, we've been planning that vacation for almost a year. Uh, Actually, my oldest daughter, Bailey, had been planning this for 18 months, but then a pandemic changed all of our travel plans. But since August of last year, we've been planning, anticipating a trip to visit family halfway around the world. Now, if you've ever planned a a vacation, even if it's just to our coast, you begin planning, you begin anticipating, and we likewise, we were excited in our planning. Our waiting became a countdown. I, I had a countdown on my phone, and when I would look at it, I would look at it in the moments where I'm tired or I'm weary and I'm making decisions about COVID and all that's going on around us. It just encouraged me. So then we planned some more, and, and then we began planning what we were going to pack before we packed, and we FaceTimed, and we created our plans, and we coordinated our schedules with our children, with our family. And then July 1st, we headed out for our adventure. And then in 10 days, it was over. All the planning, all the saving dollars and change and everything for us to to take an adventure, all the scheduling was, it was over. The trip was done. Now the memories, they're enough to build a, a mountain on, but the planning, the anticipation was, it was over. When I was younger and I was anticipating Christmas or my birthday or some other big moment, my dad would say, son, slow down. Don't wish the day away. The meaning, I guess I understand more and more is that the more I anticipate, the more it seems that the moment quickly passes. It'll be over before you know it. When we turn the page from the Old to New Testament, there has been a waiting unanticipating, not for half of a year, but for 400 years. There's been a 400 year silence, a gap in God speaking to his children through prophets that hadn't happened for 400 years. 
Now, the promise of the Redeemer had already been given. How the Redeemer had come had been foretold in many moments. The people were waiting. They weren't waiting on a family vacation or a holiday on the calendar. They were waiting upon a Savior, a Messiah, a Rescuer, a Redeemer. They were waiting for a Rescuer to come and set them free. So they waited. They planned. They longed, they searched, they hoped, and they anticipated for 400 years from generation to generation to generation, they waited. Now, sadly, many of them were looking in the wrong direction for the wrong kind of Redeemer. But then it happened. The Redeemer, Jesus, was born. The Redeemer stepped out of heaven and into the madness of this sinful world. The Creator stepped into His creation. The wait, the anticipation was over. Our passage today is one of the most recognizable moments in Scripture. What many would call the Christmas passage, Luke chapter 2. So I guess we can call today's message Christmas in July. So let me read this familiar history, this life-changing moment for each of us who claim Jesus as our Redeemer. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Familiar? Recognizable story? I hope so. There, the plan of redemption took form in a child in a manger. The angels, just a few verses later, declared the miracles to a group of shepherds by saying in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. Redemption was placed in a manger. The location, the cast of characters, the first guests to see the Savior, the Rescuer, were opposite of what many had anticipated, but it was exactly as God had promised, exactly as He had planned and delivered. When I began planning and praying about this series, I intentionally wanted to land us in this passage. Because before we continue to explore a few moments of redemption in the teachings of Jesus, before we look at the lives of the followers of Jesus and redemption, before we conclude this series later in the summer with the return of the Redeemer in Revelation, before we examine the evidence of redemption any longer, I want to make sure that in all the stories of wonder and awe, that we don't miss the Redeemer. I think it's time for us to begin to examine after all, all of our first six stories, I think it's time for us to begin to examine our response to redemption. Thus far, the stories of redemption have been powerful. They've been moving, convincing, awe-inspiring. But in order to move from awe and wonder to gratefulness that leads to godliness, we must examine our response to this moment. In Luke chapter 2, the coming of the Savior, the Lord, Jesus Christ. What is our response to redemption offered through Jesus? Now, I want to read a little further in Luke chapter 2. It's a passage that's too often neglected from, at Christmas, but it's of monumental importance. The stage is set, and Mary and Joseph would follow the tradition for the baby, for Jesus, the tradition of circumcision, and on the eighth day, they would go to the temple and they would make appropriate sacrifices. But upon their entry to the temple, the Redeemer is recognized even as a baby. Why? Because two people at the temple had been waiting, anticipating, planning, expecting, 
unlike any two others recorded in the New Testament. Verse 21 through 34, give us these stories. And, and at the end of the eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said to the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves, here's the sacrifice, or two young pigeons would be offered. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon literally says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, your deliverance, your rescue. He goes on to say that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Another quick pause. This is important. A devout, dedicated Jewish man recognizes in this moment that the Redeemer, Jesus, would be for all people, not only for his Jewish tradition following people, it would even be for their societal enemies of the day, the Gentiles. He continues, and for the glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The meaning of verse 34 is profound. and It's an ominous promise about Jesus this child that Simeon was having the opportunity to hold, the meaning of this verse is that those who view themselves as upright before God by their own accomplishments will stumble. They will trip over this Messiah. They will refuse to lay aside their pride so that Jesus Christ alone is their salvation. But those who confess their sin and their need for Jesus as a rescuer as a redeemer, as a ransom, will be raised up. The coming of Jesus brought opposition from the proud. Why? Because he revealed the thoughts of their hearts. There's a tremendous weight in Simeon's word to Mary when he tells her, he says, a, a sword will pierce through your soul also. This is a prophetic weight given to Mary that, that as her son, the redeemer, Jesus Christ, He'll become a payment for the sins of all mankind that the turmoil, the anguish that she would face would be like that of a sword piercing her soul. Now there's so much, so much we can unpack in Simeon's song, as many call it, in his message to Mary and Joseph in this moment. But I, I want to take a moment, I want to take a moment in this message to all who trust in the Lord. I want to take a moment for us to see his first response to the Redeemer. Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. On our family vacation, we, we stayed on a military base and every time we went in or out of the base, you had to show your ID, had to be with somebody with a military ID to proceed through the gate 
No matter what time of the day, there was a soldier that was always there to watch, to protect, to guard, to check, to anticipate someone coming onto the base. The action and the wording here about Simeon coming to the temple creates the same image in my mind. Here in the temple, you have this righteous, God-fearing man standing, watching, waiting, anticipating that the promise that had been made to him is that a redeemer would come in his lifetime. Mary and Joseph come in fulfilling the law and the traditions, carrying Jesus into the temple. And upon seeing Jesus, he reaches out, he takes this child and he said, my shift at the temple is up. I've been waiting. Now your servant can depart in peace. Here, I believe we find our first response to the promise of redemption through Jesus Christ. How do we respond to redemption? We respond by knowing that we are people who can live and die in peace. Simeon had been waiting, anticipating the Redeemer coming into the room and he declares, ladies and gentlemen, I'm out. I can now go in peace. And not simply because he got a glimpse of Jesus, but because he knew the promise of Jesus was and it is and would be to come. He would be salvation, hope, promise, fulfillment to the Jews and the Gentiles. The Redeemer has come. Simeon announces it one way. Paul announces it this way. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whether you live for another 60 years or 60 hours, please know this, that because there is a Redeemer, we cannot be robbed of the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. Do you have peace through a relationship with the Redeemer, Jesus Christ? This is how I want to make sure that you respond first. Do you have peace through a relationship with the Redeemer, Jesus Christ? Have you placed your trust and your hope in Him? Peace. There's not a lot of this in this world right now, is there? Why? Because if we're honest, we spend a lot of time putting hope in things and people and processes that are simply unable to bring peace. Peace comes through a relationship to the Redeemer. I want to make a promise to you. If you and I spend all of our time and all of our energy per pursuing the news of the day, putting trust in an athlete or a politician, Republican or Democrat, if we spend all of our energy on climbing a ladder to success, hoping that each step on the ladder will bring more peace, in the end, when tragedy strikes, when things shift in the opposite direction of your hopes and your dreams, then peace goes with it. It wanes. It disappears. But peace comes through a relationship to the Redeemer. So this week, I want to challenge you with a few ways to respond to the Redeemer with peace. I want to challenge you to trade a certain amount of minutes that you would determine, trade 10 minutes of watching whatever that you watch, whatever that you take in, trade 10 minutes of watching your favorite show and spend this time on your relationship with Jesus. Reading His Word, memorizing verses on peace, jotting down prayers of gratefulness and praise. Another way is to pursue peace. If watching something frustrates and irritates you and angers you, turn it off. If a social feed, media feed gives you anxiety, delete it. If there's a relationship in your life that is strained, prayerfully begin seeking peace. Pursue it. Start small. But get started. Simeon responded by saying he could now go in peace. Why? Because that was his response to the Redeemer. And ask yourself, most importantly, ask yourself, have I trusted in Jesus as my peace-giving Redeemer?
If you don't have that relationship, you can begin by declaring your sin, your need for a redeemer, asking him to rescue you through the grace of Jesus. Church and community and those that are watching, let's be very transparent. If the last 16 months have taught us anything, it's this reality. Nothing in this world can sustain life-giving peace. Nothing. It can be taken away in a moment. Every person, every device, every medical promise can be pulled out from under us in a day. We need peace. The moment Jesus arrived, a righteous man declared what we all need and want to declare, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. So our first response to these moments of awe and wonder and redemption, peace. But as we move forward, we see another life-giving response to the Redeemer and someone else that's been waiting and anticipating. In verse 36 and 37, now there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel and the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple worshiping and fasting and prayer night and day. Anna's first response to the Redeemer occurs before she sees the Redeemer. Her everyday actions were preparing her heart for the Redeemer. She didn't depart from the temple. She was worshiping with fasting and with prayer day and night. If you and I, if we spend your life, our lives in anticipation, then the recognition and the response to the Redeemer never fades. We'll see that in a moment from her. One of the reasons I wanted to enter the New Testament with this Christmas passage is to renew the understanding that the story of Jesus, the story of the Redeemer is not a seasonal Christmas message. It is not only a message for times of turmoil. It is a message for the everyday Redemption transforms our eternity. It transforms our everyday relationship to the Lord. So if we spend our lives, as Anna did, in anticipation of eternity, then the recognition and the response to the Redeemer never fades. She worshiped. This word for worship is synonymous with being a servant. She served as she waited. She performed the traditions day in and day out. Her preparation prepared her heart for the Redeemer. She fasted. She committed her times of eating to times of prayer. Why? She wanted to know the Redeemer. She wanted to know when He arrived. She prayed. She praised God. She submitted herself to God. And then she repeated those habits over and over every day. I stated at the beginning of our time online this week that Wednesday night we're going to have a time of worship and prayer. Can I challenge you this Wednesday, whether or not you can attend this time at 630? Can I, can I challenge you that from lunch until our gathering on Wednesday evening that you would fast, that you would refrain from eating? Now, I know people have different restrictions and things that they can and cannot do, things like this, but, but if you can, Let's practice Anna's example. Let's worship fast and pray and begin praying. God, prepare my heart to pray, to worship, to pray for others, to receive your word on Wednesday night. I want to challenge you to join us. It would be amazing to have three or 400 people gathered in this room in a spirit of prayer this Wednesday. So how do we respond to the Redeemer? We have peace, but now we worship, we fast, and we pray. Then Anna comes upon the Redeemer. I don't know if Simeon is holding Jesus in the air for all to see as he declares peace and salvation for all people, or if Mary and Joseph are now going through the traditions, but whatever the case, she knew it was Jesus. She knew it was the Redeemer. Verse 38 tells us, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him 
to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Another way for us to respond to the Redeemer, to all these moments of awe and wonder, is to give thanks. We respond to the Redeemer with a spirit of gratitude. The moment we begin to give thanks in our lives for our salvation, the moment we begin to give thanks for our Redeemer, something powerful happens. We shift away from ourselves to something greater. We step out of our fears, out of our immediate problems and our worries, and into a moment and some moments of wonder and splendor and joy. We thank God for the smallest of things in our lives. But we never forget the salvation through the forgiveness of sins, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So another challenge for you this week. When you face fear and worry this week, replace it with gratitude. Write it. Text it to a friend. Make a note. Speak it. Sing it. Great is your faithfulness. I thank God. But when it is the hardest, sing the loudest, even through tears and pain. When it doesn't make sense, stop and ask someone else who loves you. Would you remind me of some things in my life to be thankful for today? When you're pummeled with turmoil, speak thankfulness and gratitude into those moments. Don't let the broken, sinful world create and cast your vision and how you plan to go about life, because it will. Instead, function from a place of gratitude because you have a Redeemer. Anna began thanking God for the Redeemer. But there is another response. Verse 38 tells us that Anna continued to do what? To speak of Him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So how do we respond to the Redeemer? Now this is where it gets serious. If we have been redeemed, we must tell others about the Redeemer. Anna tells the others that she knew that we're waiting. But the application, the, the implication here is not that she only spoke to the Jews waiting on the promised Messiah, but to anyone who would listen. The Redeemer has come. The Redeemer has come. And how did she have the confidence to do this? because her preparation of worship and prayer and fasting, and then her encounter with thankfulness, this 84-year-old woman rejuvenated into telling those around her that she had seen the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. If we have been redeemed, then we must tell others about the Redeemer. I get so excited about so many things in life, and events and happenings, things that will not bring peace. Yet they're easy to talk about. Why? Because we don't cross lines and enter the personal. But that also means many times we don't enter into the conversations with people that we care about and love the most. We don't enter, enter their lives in conversations with things that are eternal. If we have experienced redemption through Jesus Christ, then we are commanded and empowered to speak of Jesus. So let's get practical again. You have your ways to be thankful. You have your ways to walk through some of these other ideas today, but let's talk about getting practical about sharing the Redeemer. Take time this week to tell someone that you love about your relationship to Jesus, your Redeemer. If you can't figure out who to start with, and you are watching this with somebody in your home, look to the left, look to the right, start with someone in the room. Pick someone that you talk to on the phone every day. Give them a call. Someone you're comfortable with. Start, share the story with someone you love. Take time this week to tell someone you love about your relationship to Jesus. Anna got prepared. She worshiped, she prayed, she fasted. So let's get prepared. Write out your redemption story this week. Maybe even before you leave the property, grab your phone or your device and start jotting down your redemption story. Another way is get bold. Share your redemption story on social media. 
Now, as I was typing this late at night, I, I began thinking, imagine if every day, everybody that's watching this online or in person, if, if every day for the next 30 days, everyone in this room on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or whatever is out there, what if you started every day by proclaiming your love for Jesus? What if you didn't repost an ad or forward anything other than your redemption story? Another way that we can practically share is get prepared to share. Worship, fast, pray, give thanks. Be ready to tell the truth of the Redeemer. Redemption stories are powerful. They cover almost every page of Scripture. But if we are not careful, if we're not careful, then we'll walk out of this room. We'll be amazed. We'll be in awe. But will we be led to gratefulness and godliness? Anna and Simeon led the way. Thank God for these two seasoned adults who passionately pursued and waited and planned for the Redeemer. They experienced the Messiah and they were able to depart in peace, worship, and thankfulness, telling others about the redemption that had come in Jesus. This is our calling, our response to redemption. It's our turn to respond to the Redeemer in peace, gratefulness, worship, fasting, prayer, and sharing the story. How do you need to respond today? Would you pray with me? God, I pray that this week we, every one of us can take a, a small step, a practical step. It could be to become more thankful, more grateful as we saw in Anna's response. It could be that this week there's someone watching who has never entered a relationship with Jesus and they're not sure how to start. They're not sure where to begin. And today they need to know that they can confess, that they can cry out to God and say, God, I do not have a relationship with the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who offered for us through his blood the forgiveness of our sins and by his grace that he lavished upon us, it is his plan to save me. Save me, rescue me today. God, maybe for many of us, we need the reminder that there's peace. Again, if, if our world has shown us anything the last 16 months is there's no peace. But may we find peace in a relationship with Jesus Christ. May we find peace so that we, no matter how many days, years, months we have, we can say, Lord, I, I simply want to be able to declare that I can depart in peace because I have a relationship with the Redeemer. Help us to be grateful. Help us to be worshipers, those who fast and pray, expecting and those who tell others about Jesus. Thank you, God, for these two wonderful people who understood redemption and responded to it in some practical ways for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to review a couple of those responses to the Redeemer. What is our response to the Redeemer? Peace comes through a relationship to the Redeemer. Maybe you want to take some time, trade 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes of watching whatever your show is, your device. Spend that on your relationship to Jesus. Pursue peace. Ask yourself this question, have I trusted in Jesus as my peace-giving Redeemer? We also can respond this week with a spirit of gratitude. Write it, talk about it, share it. And because we've been redeemed, we must tell others about the Redeemer. Take time this week. Tell someone that you love about your relationship with Jesus. Get excited. Get prepared. Write out your story. Get bold. Share your redemption story on social media or to someone that you love and care about that has resisted this story thus far. Get prepared to share. Worship, fast, pray, give thanks. Be ready to tell the truth of the Redeemer.
And again, we would love for you to join us as we do exactly those things this coming Wednesday. 6.30, thank you for joining us online.